My soul is among lions. Welcome back to Hackberry House, a podcast devoted to the Word of God and the persecuted church in North Korea. My name is Bob. This is podcast number 395. It is February 12, 2016. Well, today, part one of a message by Charles Spurgeon recorded in a book of Spurgeon's sermons called Twelve Striking Sermons, and they are. This is, I believe, the third one we've done. They're all on Puritan Hard Drive, by the way, available at PuritanDownloads.com. Among Lions is the name of the sermon. The text we've already given, My Soul is Among Lions, Psalm 57.4. Some of you cannot say this. And you ought to be very thankful that you're not obliged to do so. Happy are you young people who have godly parents and who dwell in Christian families. You ought to grow like the flowers in a conservatory where killing frosts and biting blasts are unknown. You live under very favorable circumstances. Your soul, I might almost say, is among angels. For you dwell where God is worshipped, where family prayer is not forgotten, where you can have a kindly guidance in the hour of difficulty, comfort in the time of trial. You dwell where angels come and go, and God himself deigns to dwell. Happy young people to be thus circumstanced. How grateful and how holy you ought to be. I want all who dwell there where everything helps them to recollect the many gracious ones who dwell where everything hinders them. You who live near the beautiful gate of the temple must not forget the many who are sighing in the tents of Kedar. If your soul is not among lions, praise God for it, and then let your sympathies go out toward those who mournfully complain My soul with him that hateth peace hath long a dweller been. I am for peace, but when I speak for battle, they are keen. It is a Christian duty to remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. And whenever our own favored circumstances lead us to forget those who are persecuted and tried, our very mercies are working mischief to us. We are all members one of another. If one member suffers, all the rest should suffer with him. And therefore, we will turn our thoughts towards our persecuted brethren tonight, that our united supplications may sustain them under their difficulties, and if the Lord be so pleased, may even deliver them. When may a Christian man truly say, My soul is among lions? Such is the case when either from our being members of ungodly families or from having to gain our livelihood amongst unconverted and graceless people, we are subjected to reproach and rebuke and to jest and to jeer for Jesus Christ's sake. Then we can say, my soul is among lions. Many in this congregation known to me are the only ones in their family whom God has called. I bless his name that he is often taking one of a household and a lone one of a family and bringing such to Jesus. Some quite unchristian person who thinks not of God drops in here out of curiosity and, and God meets with him and he becomes the first of his kith and kin to say, I am the Lord's. Frequently when converts come to cast in their lot with us, they will say, I do not know one in all my family who makes any profession of godliness. They are all of them opposed to me. In such a case, the soul is among lions. And it's very hard and trying to be in such a position. Well, may we pity a godly wife bound to an ungodly husband. Alas, full often a drunkard whose opposition amounts to brutality, a tender, loving spirit that ought to have been cherished like a tender flower, is bruised and trodden underfoot, 
and may just suffer till the heart cries out in grief, my soul is among lions. We little know what lifelong martyrdoms many pious women endure. Children also have to bear the same when they are singled out by divine grace from depraved and wicked families. Only the other day there came under my notice one who loves the Lord. I thought that if she had been a daughter of mine, I should have rejoiced beyond all things in her sweet and gentle piety. But the parents said, You must leave our house if you attend such and such a place of worship. We do not believe in these things, and we cannot have you about us if you do. I saw the grief which that state of things was causing, and though I could not alter it, I mourned over it. Woe unto those who tyrannize over my Lord's little ones. Nobody knows what godly working men have to put up with from those among whom they labor. Now, there are some shops where there is religious liberty, but frequently the working men of this city are great tyrants in matters of religion. I tell them that to their faces. If a man will drink with them and swear with them, they'll make him their companion. But when a man comes out to fear God, they make it very hard for him. And pray, sir, has not a man as much right to pray as you have to swear? And has he not as much right to believe in God? as you have to disbelieve. It's a wonderfully free country, this, a, a wonderfully free country. A true Briton gives that liberty to others, which he claims for himself. And if he does not choose to be religious himself, he stands up like a man to defend the rights of others to be so, if they choose. Now then, ye British workmen, when shall we see you doing this? The text speaks of a soul among lions. Why did the psalmist call them lions? Dogs is about as good a name as they deserve. Why do we call them lions? Because at times the Christian man is exposed to enemies who are very strong, perhaps strong in the jaw, very strong in biting, rending, and tearing. Sometimes the Christian man is exposed to those who loudly roar out their infidelities and their blasphemies against Christ. And it is an awful thing to be among such lions as those. The lion is not only strong but cruel. And it is real cruelty which subjects well-meaning men to reproach and misrepresentation. The enemies of Christ and his people are often as cruel as lions and would slay us, slay us, if the law permitted them. The lion is a creature of great craftiness, creeping along stealthily and then making a sudden spring. And so will the ungodly creep up to the Christian, and if possible, spring upon him, when they can catch him in an unguarded moment. If they fancy they spy a fault in him, they come down upon him with all their weight. The ungodly Watch the righteous, and if they can catch them in their speech or if they can make them angry and cause them to speak an unguarded word, how eagerly they pounce upon him. They magnify his fault, put it under a microscope of 10,000 power and, and make a great thing of it. Report it, report it, they say. And so would we have it. Anything against a true-born child of God is a sweet nut for them such as are daily watched, daily carped at, daily abused, daily hindered in everything that is good and gracious. They go with their tears before the God they serve and cry to him, My soul is among lions. Now, it is to such that I am going to speak tonight, a little at first by way of comfort, and then a little by way of advice. First, by way of comfort. You are among lions, my dear young friend. Then you will have fellowship with your Lord and with his church. Every Lord's Day and every time we meet, this benediction is pronounced upon you that you may enjoy the fellowship of the Holy Ghost. Fellowship with the Holy Ghost brings you into fellowship with Jesus. And this involves 
you're being conformed to his sufferings. Now your Lord was among lions. The men of his day had not a good word to say for him. They called the master of the house Beelzebub. They will never call you a worse name than that. They said that he was a drunken man and a wine-bibber. Possibly they may say much the same as that of you, and it will be equally false. You need not be ashamed to be pelted with the same dirt that was thrown at your master. And if it should ever come to this, that you should be stripped of everything, and false witness should rise up against you, and you should even be condemned as a felon and taken out to execution, still, you're not, you're not going to have a lot worse than his. Remember that you are the followers of a crucified Lord and cannot expect to be the world's darlings. If you are Christians, the inspired description of the Christian life is the taking up of the cross. Do you expect to be dandled on the knees of that same ungodly world which hung your master upon the gibbet? No. You know that he who is the friend of this world is the enemy of God. This truth is unchangeable. It is just as certain today as it was in years gone by that the evil hateth the righteous and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. You may pick up a fashionable religion and get through the world with it very comfortably, but if you have the true faith, you'll have to fight for it. If you are of the world, and the world will love its own. But if you are not of the world, because the Lord has chosen you out of the world, the world will hate you. Nor was your master alone. Recollect the long line of prophets that went before Christ. Which of them was it that was received with honor? Did they not stone one and slay another with the sword, cut one in pieces with a saw, put others to death with stones, you know that the march of the faithful may be tracked by their blood. And after our Lord has gone to heaven, now how did the world treat the church? In the streets of Rome and all large cities, the fierce cry was often heard, Christians to the lions! Christians to the lions! Christians to the lions! At dead of night, men cry fire. When a house is blazing... Or a mob will cry bread when they are starving. But the cry of old Rome that was dearest to the Roman heart and most expressive of their horrible enmity to goodness was Christians to the lions. Of all the gallant shows the Roman Empire ever saw, that which excited the populace beyond all things else was to see a family a man and his wife, perhaps, and a grown-up daughter and son and, and three or four children all marched into the arena and the big door thrown up that out might rush the lion and spring upon them and tear them to pieces. What harm had they done? They had forgiven their enemies. That was one of their great sins. They would not worship the gods of wood and stone. They would not blaspheme the name of Jesus, whom they loved, for he had taught them to love one another and to love all mankind. For such things as this, men raised the cry, Christians, to the lions. All along this has been the cry of the world against all who have faithfully followed in the steps of Jesus Christ. Just now the merciful hand of providence prevents open persecution. This is 19th century Britain. But only let that hand be taken away and the old spirit will rage again. The seed of the serpent hates the seed of the woman still. And if the old dragon were not chained, he would devour the man-child as he has often tried to do. Do not deceive yourselves. In one form or other, the old howl of Christians to the lions would soon be heard in London if almighty power did not sit upon the throne and restrain the wrath of man. You who have to suffer a measure of persecution for Christ's sake ought to be very glad of it, for you are counted worthy not only to be Christians, but to suffer for Christ's sake. 
Do not, I pray you, be unworthy of your high calling, but endure hardness as good soldiers of Jesus Christ. In these afflictions you are having fellowship with your head and with his mystical body, and therefore be not ashamed. Here's another thought. If you're among lions, you should thereby be driven nearer to your God. When you had a great many friends, you could rejoice in them. But now that these turn against you and the truth has come home to you, a man's foes shall be they of his own household, what ought you to do? Why, get closer to God than ever you were before. Jesus Christ so loved his church that he said as he looked at his poor disciples, these are my mother, my sister and brother. You should do what your master did. Make his church your father and mother and sister and brother. Nay, better still, make Christ all these to you and more. Take the Lord Jesus to be everything that all the dearest of mortals could be and far more. Sing that charming verse, which is a great favorite of mine, for it was very precious to me in days gone by. If on my face for thy Dear name, shame and reproaches be. All hail reproach and welcome shame if thou remember me. Be sure that you live near to God. All Christians ought to do so, but you especially should be driven by every false accusation, by every caustic remark, by every cutting sentence nearer to your Father's bosom. The more they rebuke you, the more constantly should you abide under the covert of his sacred wings and find your joy in the Lord. And getting close to Christ, let me say to you now by way of advice and by way of comfort too, endeavor to be very calm and happy. Do not mind it. Take as little notice of the scoff as ever you can. It is a grand thing to have one deaf ear. Mind that you keep yourself very deaf to slander and reproach, as the psalmist did when he said, I was as a man that that heareth not, and in whose mouth are no reproofs. One blind eye towards the folly of enemies is often of more use to a man than two eyes that are always looking about with suspicion. Don't see everything. Don't hear everything. When there is a hard word spoken, do not notice it. Or if you must hear it, forget it as quickly as ever you can. Love others all the more, the less they love you. Repay their enmity with love. Heap coals of fire upon them by making no return to a hard speech except by another deed of kindness. Very seldom defend yourself. It's a waste of breath. Casting pearls before swine. Bear and bear again. Recollect that our Lord has sent us forth as sheep among wolves. And sheep cannot defend themselves. The wolf can eat all the sheep if it likes. But do you not see there are more sheep in the world now than there are wolves? Ten thousand to one. Though the wolves have had all the eating, and though there never yet was a sheep that devoured a wolf, yet still the sheep are here. Those wolves have gone. The sheep have won that victory, and so will Christ's little flock. The anvil is struck by the hammer, and the anvil never strikes in return. And yet the anvil wears the hammer out. Patience baffles fury and vanquishes malice. The non-resistance principle involves a resistance which is irresistible. The steady patience that cannot be provoked, but which, like Jesus... When reviled, reviles not again, is certain of conquest. This is what you persecuted ones need to learn. To get more near your God, the more you are among the lions. So to be the more calm and patient, the more men rage against you. A third piece of comfort is this. Please to recollect that although your soul is among lions, the lions are chained. When Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, the lions were hungry and would soon have devoured him, but you know why it was that they could not touch him. 
Ah, the angel came. Just as the fierce lions were about to seize on Daniel, down he came swift from heaven and stood in front of them. Hush, said he, and, and they lay as still as a stone. And so says the text. My God hath sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths. Now, they had fine teeth, but their mouths were shut. If the Lord can easily shut a lion's mouth, he can quite as easily shut the mouth of an ungodly man. He can take off all the trouble from you, if he wills it, in an instant. And he can give you a smooth path to heaven when it pleases him. Only remember that if everything on the road to heaven were smooth, heaven would not be so sweet at the end. And we should not have an opportunity of displaying those Christian graces which are brought out and educated by the opposition of the world. God will not quench the fire of persecution, for it consumes our dross, but he will moderate its power so that not a grain of pure metal shall be lost. The lions are chained, dear friend. They can go no farther than God permits. In this country, the most they can do as a rule is to howl. They cannot bite. Howling does not break bones. Why then be afraid? The man who is afraid of being laughed at is not half a man, but almost deserves the scorn he receives. Never mind what is said. Talking will not hurt you. Harden your spirit against it and bear it gallantly. Go and tell your Lord of it if your heart fails you, and then go forward. Calm as your master was, fearing nothing, for God will hear you. He'll bear you through. The lions can roar, but they cannot. <laughs> they cannot hurt you. Fear them not. They cannot rend. That's one half of a message called Among Lions. I can't wait to read the rest of it to you on Monday. And in between now and Monday, we talk about North Korea and the real persecution that's going on there that goes far beyond what Spurgeon ever experienced. And so it's a good package of messages. Tomorrow we, we take a break. Thank you so much for being with me. I, I trust that you will go over to my store at sermonaudio.com forward slash a servant 70. And I take it you're there right now. Just click on store and see the books that God has given me the grace to put together over the years and uh, check them out and follow me if you will on Twitter that I've just re-signed up with on Twitter my handle is doulos d-o-u-l-o-s 76 doulos 76 at doulos 76 you know how to do that if you're a Twitterite God bless you. We will talk again Sunday, as I said, about North Korea. And next week, a little bit of a, mm, let's call it a kicking up of the notch, kicking it up a notch a little bit. Next week, we're going to try something a little different. I'll tell you about it later. It's always good to have you. Don't forget Psalm 57.4. Keep the theme in mind. I hope it's not true of you, but if it is, it's a, it's a good thing. According to Spurgeon, according to Jesus. And we have some good things to share with you about it. My soul is among lions.